Mega Mechatronics. Welcome back to Mega Mechatronics. We are starting a new tutorial series called Tuning 101, which will cover automotive engine calibrations. In this series, we'll be covering inputs and outputs, speed density versus mass airflow, non-wide open throttle tuning, wide open throttle tuning, spark tuning, and injector calibration. Disclaimer, please don't blame me for your problems. Please take responsibility for your actions, and please make intelligent and researched decisions. So what the Tuning 101 series is going to do, it's going to help you make those intelligent and researched decisions, because we're going to give you the basic strategy, but you're going to have to go out there and figure out what your engine needs, because there's just so many different variables, different tuners, different ECU types, and then obviously what the engine likes. So step one with any tuning project is going to be to uh, make sure your vehicle is maintained and repaired. With any type of intake or exhaust leak, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you so many problems. You're never going to get your engine calibrated. A little crack in your exhaust, uh, a manifold, exhaust manifold leak... Uh, bad gasket, things like that, you, you have to repair it. There's no getting around it. And you also want to replace or clean up any old sensors and make sure your vehicle's tuned up. You don't want a, a worn out cap and rotor, uh, bad wires or spark plugs that are on their last few thousand miles. So an analogy is, uh, trying to, to tune an engine with problems is like trying to fill up a, a flat tire with damage in it that isn't repaired. Okay, it won't hold air and it can cause an accident. And an accident in our application with tuning is blowing a hole through your piston. And we don't want that. So the uh, engine tuning loop, this is a cycle that you're going to complete 10, 20, 100, 500 times until your engine's calibrated. So you're going to be recording inputs, you're going to analyze those results, and then calibrate the outputs. And hopefully that will change your inputs towards your goal the next time around. And you can see you're going to continually be going through this cycle. So let's start with part one here. We'll look at some inputs, in particular the oxygen sensor or sensors on uh, V8 or V6 types of engines. So it's exactly what you think it is, pretty much. It measures oxygen content. So less oxygen content will correlate that to a rich condition because there was excess fuel in there that burned all of the remaining oxygen. And when we read more oxygen in the exhaust byproducts, we'll correlate that to a lean condition because there wasn't enough fuel in there to convert all of the air into to during the combustion process. And just to know, a misfire, a misfire where the air-fuel mixture never combusts, you'll have raw oxygen flowing through the exhaust. So, of course, we'll get a false lean reading. And now we get to lambda. Lambda is an air-fuel equivalence ratio. You can think of it as kind of an air-fuel ratio unit. I think of it as a universal language. So... This is something you want to get used to using, and you should be using this. And it makes a lot of sense and helps with tuning your errors and, and understanding how uh, what percentage off you are. So a lambda of 1.0 for any fuel, a lambda of 1.0 is called stoichiometric. So stoichiometric is the, the uh, air-fuel ratio that produces a chemically complete combustion combustion event. So a certain type of fuel requires a certain amount of oxygen to completely burn. So that's what the air fuel ratio is. You have so many pounds of air for every pound of fuel and that will stay consistent as long as the fuel stays consistent. And this will work for all types of four stroke fuels and using the same sensor and calibration it doesn't matter. So let's look at some popular fuels and their air-fuel ratios, their stoichiometric air-fuel ratios. And these are theoretical, chemically uh, perfect ratios here. 
So for compressed natural gas up top, we have 17.5 pounds of air for every one pound of fuel. And when we look at E85, it's 9.8 pounds of air for every one pound of fuel. And down at methanol, 6.4 pounds of air for every one pound of methanol. So for running compressed natural gas at this ratio, it, it will read lambda of 1.0. And let's say you're using the same exact gauge to measure all of these different fuels. So when these different fuels are running at these ratios, it will output lambda 1.0, or you're running at lambda 1.0. So where it gets confusing is with these uh, gauges that you can buy, these off-the-shelf kind of less expensive gauges, they're lambda sensors. However, they calibrate them to output different digits. So typically they will calibrate them to pure gasoline, which is 14.7. So let's look at this example. It's a wideband air fuel gauge um, that's calibrated for gasoline. So when you're running gasoline at stoichiometric, it will output 14.7. But what's really happening is they're measuring lambda 1.0 and outputting 14.7 or scaling it so that outputs 14.7. So when you're running E85, and so let's say you're running E85 and you're using this gauge that's calibrated for gasoline. When you're running E85 at stoichiometric, the gauge is going to read 14.7, which is good. It's lambda 1.0. So if you try to target your air fuel ratio using this improper gauge for E85 and you try to target 9.8, you'll be running so rich that you'll just be misfiring and diluting your engine oil. But the point here is that this gauge can be used for these different types of fuels. It's just you you have to understand that 14.7 is a lambda of 1.0, and that 14.7 has nothing to do with actual air-fuel ratio, unless, of course, you're running pure gasoline. So let's look at, uh, let's get deeper into air-fuel ratios. This is important. So this is a chart we need to get used to. On the vertical axis, we have our lambda readings. One Lambda 1.5 is really lean. Lambda 0.5 is really rich. And, of course, lambda 1.0 is stoichiometric. And I just, up on the other side, I threw gasoline in there. So in the very middle, we have our stoichiometric air-fuel ratio. This is the chemically perfect ratio to get complete combustion. And what I'm trying to show here is the different types of sensors. So there's a narrow band type of sensor and a wide band type of sensor. So the narrow band sensor is, you know, it, it works. It, for the price, for the cost versus performance, it does the job. But it kind of acts like a switch. So it's either lean or rich. But when you're at that switching threshold, you are on stoichiometric. So it does work, and it will work for your tuning application when you're tuning stoichiometric. However, you can see the wideband is significantly different, and the range that it can measure is significantly larger, and the wideband sensor is going to be very important for tuning wide open throttle in addition to tuning open loop if that's the type of strategy you're going to roll with. So let's take a uh, look at a log of the oxygen sensors. Uh, so I have the lambda sensors in yellow and the narrowband sensors in gray. So I tried to scale them very similar so they have similar max min near stoichiometric. But what I wanted to illustrate is the uh, inaccuracy of the narrowband sensor outside of stoichiometric where you can see the lambda sensor is picking up still uh, reading accurate data where the narrowband sensor is maxed out. So looking at the wideband sensor, uh, let's say this is our danger zone, and then we have a wide open throttle target line, because typically under high load, wide open throttle conditions, you're going to be running richer than stoichiometric. It's not the, the maximum power is not stoichiometric. You're going to be richer than that. So depending on your engine type and the fuel you're using, you're going to be 15 to 25% richer. 
So we have a wide open throttle target line, which is going to be different than stoichiometric. So here would be like a time log of an, the oxygen sensor reading where over here we're cruising and we're switching back and forth um, uh, around stoichiometric. And then we, we slam on the gas pedal, wide open throttle. We go pedal to the metal. I'm dropping the hammer. And you can see it dips down and gets a little rich, richer than our wide open throttle target line. And then you see it comes back to our target line and then gets lean. And then comes back to our target and it looks like it gets lean again. So the problem with the narrow band, if you see this dashed line that just appeared, the narrow band will be pinned or, or maxed out or minned out right there. And it's not going to pick up that, uh, that rich condition. It's not going to pick up those lean conditions there. And that can be very dangerous. And that could lead to lost potential for your engine where it, the, the, under wide open throttle, it leans out. So you retarded the timing and lost 15, 20% power where if you corrected the fueling issue, you'd, you wouldn't have, um, lost all that power by retarding the timing because you're running a lean mixture. Yeah.